As I understand it, uh, the class has set itself the goal of contributing to leadership building, intended as a resource for challenging dysfunction, inequity, violence, and corruption in society. And of course, it's the job of the class to figure out how best to uh, accomplish that laudable goal with their resources. But our job is at least to consider some of the framing issues, the background and substantive issues related to, to leadership and its <coughs> barriers. One of the definitions or the notions of leadership that I found most inspirational is the one offered by Ila Bhatt. A great leader, she said, is somebody who creates other leaders. And I think that's a very powerful um, uh, notion because, of course, she's talking about grassroots leadership. She's talking about how you really do transform dysfunctional societies, how you do eradicate corruption from the bottom up, how you create an empowered uh, community. Turning to barriers, again, I think it might be helpful to think about uh, different categories of barriers. So, again, we might think of individual barriers. So a lack of confidence, or lack of capability, educational deprivation, lack of mentorship. And then, of course, there are family and community barriers, the most obvious of which might be gender norms, if we're talking about women's leadership in the Muslim world. And thirdly, there are societal barriers, which I suppose are the ones that maybe we're going to think about most here. Poverty, the struggle for survival, race, class, religion, other types of discrimination. And maybe most importantly, maldistribution of power, of resources, of weaponry, of access to the possibility of leadership. And what I'd like to do is to start, uh, Farzana, if I may, with you, uh, Farzana Yakub, who is actually a leader. That it is an environment which makes a leader. It's, it might not be the regular norms or the boxes that we have created, in the educated society and not so educated society which makes a leader. Your environment, your life, your situation is what makes you a leader. A leader is also someone <clears throat> who your heart follows. Leila, I'm going to turn to you next. Leila Fadel is an Edward Murrow Press Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and she has been an international correspondent with NPR for years. She spent the last five or six years in Cairo. So the women that I've come across who are leaders uh, lead in the spaces that they can find. So there are obviously women in parliament in Egypt. There are also women um, in leadership roles in Tunisia, in Syria. The face of the regime for a long time was a woman. Um, but where they're transforming, I, I did a profile on a, on a woman in Egypt who had been an activist for a long time and felt that space became quite dangerous. So she decided to try to empower people through food. So she went to rural areas. She plucked women who were interested in bringing money into the home, um, used them to start businesses, a catering businesses, slow growth movement, slow foods, this whole very hipster kind of idea that you'll see here in Brooklyn. She was doing that with a mix of Italian and Egyptian food. But what she did almost by accident is empower these women to then be leaders in their own communities. They are now bringing in money. They are also representing a face of a class of Egyptian society that the upper class never sees and never interacts with on an equal level. So I felt that that is leadership because the other big barrier uh, for people is economics and exposure. Leaders uh, come through exposure. They, if they're exposed, to people through whatever means it may be, through the media, through reality TV, through the fact that there was a leader in their family that then opened doors for them, then they get to different audiences, different places. So I think exposure is a huge part of all of this. Um, I'm going to um, now turn to uh, Peter Goldbraith. Um, so Peter, I wanted to ask you, first of all, how do you define this arc of trouble? Because I have a feeling you might have been part of the group that um, coined the phrase. So these are places that uh, they're in the news because of uh, uh, violent conflict. Uh, obviously, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and really sig significantly in Pakistan. Um, uh, instability. Uh, uh, certainly, locus of... Um, of extremism, not, not solely, but uh, significantly, 
And there, there's a striking correlation uh, between all of that and the fact that this is the part of the world where women uh, are least represented in public life. I, I, you know, having sort of been in government a long time, I have thought about leadership as that the optimal place to be may not be at the top. It is really at the place where you are toward the top and you have the knowledge of the issue or subject matter that you're dealing with. For the people who have, who are, who have the knowledge, you can't be at, totally at the bottom, but you know, not necessarily at the top. So you that's an interesting difference. paradox. It's a different notion of leadership that you're advancing. To be a leader in the sense of influencing, positively influencing an outcome, is actually a detriment to be right at the top. And, and that really comes back to uh, questions of what is leadership. Yeah. Because if we are looking at ways in which, well, including Kennedy School, we can contribute to, to um, leadership, it's not hopeless. Because the various changes that are made uh, uh, can begin to make a difference. Now, it's hard, but, but it, is, it, you know, it is, again, being at that point where you have both the knowledge and are high enough to make the difference. Last panelist, Maruf. Saeed is a Pakistani entrepreneur who is on the board of directors of the Pakistan Innovation Foundation, amongst many other responsibilities. What do you, from your vantage point, see as barriers? A lot of times we conflate leadership with authority, uh, but leadership can exist at multiple levels, as uh, Peter alluded to. And I think um, we have to provide, uh, in the sense that that is a clear barrier in terms of not being able to build capacity. The environment is, um, is prohibitive, if you, uh, if you can use the word, but prohibitive in allowing uh, people to transform society or use their whatever level of leadership they have to, uh, to affect change. I have felt the same thing, that the, the absence of a space to have scholarship uh, like this room, for example, this open dialogue that we're having now about the Muslim <laughs> world, there aren't that many rooms like this in the countries where I've worked, where people can openly discuss what's a woman's role, what's, what does Islam say about a woman's role, what, does, what, is our, what is our ability here, what can we do? <coughs> that gets shut down so fast in so many countries that I've worked in, and so much of the scholarship about um, Islam in the modern world or leadership that comes out, comes out from people from that diaspora in Western countries. So the idea that the discussion can't happen, I think is the first problem when it comes to leadership in general. That the discussion doesn't exist and the spaces for that discussion don't exist. So the environment and the space I think is most important, the democratic institutions. That's what I see when I'm there because the demonization of certain thoughts creates this sort of polarized, dangerous environment. Uh, leadership doesn't have to emerge only from you know, power corridors, but it can emerge from private sector, it can emerge from nonprofit entities. And uh, the, these mavericks are a byproduct of the environment that they find themselves in. Uh, they are rebels by design. And uh, they are rebels because the environment doesn't allow them to function in any other way. Uh, they have to break rules to actually uh, move forward. We, we have a very, in, in this country, a very linear view. You're in office and you're in power. But in large parts of the world, including this part of the world, you can be in power and not in office, and in office and not in power. You might be talking to the prime minister, and you might be talking to a position. But where is the actual power might not be in that position. The actual power might be somewhere else. Just to illustrate, in Benazir's case, the, this issue between being in power and being in office. Uh, before she came into office, and, 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 and when she came into office, and I was with her in Larkana when she won the election, one of the things that we talked about was the importance, and this was key to her political success, was taking resources from the military 
and putting them into the civilian sector. I mean, Pakistan has a predatory military. And uh, so one of the things was that she didn't want the F-16s because they were a huge chunk of the budget. Fast forward six months, and I'm coming there with a couple of times, three or four times with different senators, and she's making the pitch for the F-16s. Did she want them? No. Did she want me to do what I could to stop them? Yes. But there's the guy from the Air Force, the head of the Air Force, at the lunch. And so, you know, there she is trying to be charming to the senators to, to, to make the pitch. So, you know, our idea that the person who was prime minister was actually in power, I mean, it was not even within her power to cancel a weapon system that was unnecessary and was basically depriving money for education for Pakistani children. She and her mother and the party workers were beaten up, were killed, were maimed. But people stood by them. Why? Because the leaders were with the people. They were not away from the people, of the people, for the people, by the people. That's what she presented to Pakistanis. And that is why she is such an icon, she and her father. But once she was the prime minister, it was not the people that she had to lead. It was, the, it was these executing administrative governance agencies that she had to lead, and they did not want to be led. And that is something that is not just particular for Pakistan. So, so when we are talking about this leadership program, and, and I'm bringing this up because let's not aim towards having these uh, people which, we, which the, the, uh, the planners think will be leading people. They could be guiding those people who will be leading people. That will also make a difference.